Thank you for being here. Welcome as we're gathered to worship. We gather week by week because God is worthy of our worship. He is the one who made us. He, is, he has revealed himself to us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he is good and worthy of our affections, of our praise. So welcome. That's what we're here to do, to give ascribe worth to God, to worship him. So welcome. This uh, Sunday in January is often observed by the church in our country as the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. So we're going to take note of that and pray for the cause of life in our country. I'm going to preach a sermon uh, in Psalm 22 and other scriptures about the dignity of human life. Um, and we just want to be mindful of that. And so one way we can support a culture of life and the dignity of life is by supporting our Pregnancy Resource Center. So out in the foyer, there's a crate full of baby bottles. And we participate in this every year. The PRC has a baby bottle campaign where you take a bottle home, fill it with change or cash or write a check, whatever. And then we gather all the bottles back and all the churches in the area contribute to the PRC in that way, helping them to raise funds so that they can serve <coughs> women in our community, especially ones that are uh, facing unexpected pregnancies or other difficulties. So take note of that. There's a note on the back of the bulletin about that. Also, there's a note about Women's Bible Study, which meets on Mondays. Uh, men are gathering this Tuesday evening. To, we're doing a book study and a study of 1 John, so talk to me if you'd like to know more about that. Um, but other than that, we will, we're continuing forward together as a church, uh, trusting God, putting our faith in Him more and more, keeping in step with His Spirit. We're here to worship Him, so welcome. We're going to begin with a call to worship. And then singing, come behold the wondrous mystery, the dawning of the King. Our King is the Lord Jesus Christ. We are here to worship Him. Would you stand with me? We'll be called to worship in Psalm 100, where we read, and then we'll, we'll respond with glad singing. We have a good King, who is a good shepherd, who died for us, so that we might live forever. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Let's worship him. <laughs>
pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, we are gathered this morning to worship you, for you are worthy. You are the one who made us. You're the one who keeps us. You are the one who planned this great story of redemption so that we might be forgiven and made whole and made new. Oh, Lord God, we give you praise that you have not left us to ourselves to wander as orphans, but you have called us to yourself and adopted us as your children. And Lord, Father, we want to worship your Son, who you did send. And we have just called one another to come behold the wondrous mystery of Christ the Lord upon the tree. Oh Lord, you help us to behold him with the eyes of faith. Help us to take hold of that truth that brings life, that he hung there in the stead of ruined sinners, that we might be counted righteous that we might be counted among the many sons and daughters brought to glory, that we might be among those who experience grace unmeasured, love untold. Lord, would you change us? Would you be present here with us? Would you strengthen our voices to sing your praise? Would you be pleased with our worship? And because we have gathered in the name of your Son, and we ask for his Spirit to fill our hearts, to fill this place, to strengthen us, to leave here as your people, filled with your love, that we might offer that love to those who are lost and hurting and afraid and ashamed. Oh Lord, would you strengthen us to bring glory in our everyday lives, Lord? Thank you for this time. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to sing.
Our New Testament reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. It is appropriate for the Sanctity of Life Sunday. We're going to rewind a little bit. We just came through Christmas. We're going to rewind the story a little bit. Before Jesus was born, Luke writes, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah, and she greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. We're going to transition to a time of confession of sin. We're going to do this collectively to start it together. The confession is in your bulletin. So we'll read it together and then I'll, I'll read the, the Declaration of Forgiveness from 1 John. But confess with me out of the words from the bulletin. Almighty and, and most merciful God, God. We are thankful that your mercy is higher than the heavens, wider than our lives, deeper than all our sins. Forgive our careless attitudes for your purposes, our reluctance to relieve the suffering of others, our envy of those who have more than we know, our neglect of your wise and gracious law. Renew our minds and help us to change so that we may desire what is good, love what you love, and do what you command, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I want you to hear these words. <coughs> this is from 1 John. It says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look, normally when we confess sins, we take a time to individually examine ourselves. And that's good. Each one of us has to deal with our own sin. Uh, but for me, often, or again, for me often, I miss the Declaration of Forgiveness, because we roll through it. So I'm, we're gonna take a minute this morning to remember what we just sang. That with a shout, you, Jesus, rose victorious, resting victory from the grave, that you lead captives in your wake. This is the truth. He is faithful and just to forgive you. So we're going to take a moment right now to meditate on that truth. And then we're going to go in and respond to the same, okay? So go to him joyfully, right? You've been rested from, from the grave. And we'll, I'll, say it one, I'll say it one more time and then we'll respond to the same. Just take a moment to, to meditate. Believer, these words are for you. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's stand and respond to sin. <laughs>
We are pilgrims on the way, brothers and sisters, right together, headed home to the one we were meant to be in a relationship with perfectly. So it's a privilege to pray for one another as pilgrims on that way, right? So this is a time of congregational prayer uh, and thanksgiving and petition. And as Brian mentioned the, in the announcements this morning, we'll pray for the PRC specifically and then broadly. Like, we want to be praying for all aspects of this um, this notion, this idea of the sanctity of human life, right? Um, if you follow the news, it could be a big year. Um, if you don't follow the news, that's okay too. Um, we nonetheless want to pray for the sanctity of babies and um, people at the end of life too, right? There's some crazy things that are going on in the world as people are getting older and how we treat them. So we want to be praying, be mindful of that. Uh, there's other kingdom prayers in, in the bulletin. Boonsboro, the Presbyterian, out in Lynchburg, and Estachio serving in Belize. Uh, and then we've got a number of different updates for uh, PPC folks. I don't know if Brian mentioned, I don't think I heard. It. So John and Hanyan flew in from Houston, I think? Drove. 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 Oh my word. So he drove home with COVID. Okay, so John has COVID and he's here in a hotel. He's not here. Yeah. We can pray for John. The point is, John has COVID and he's not here. We can be praying for him. Uh, and I know there are a couple other families that called in like sick this morning that are not feeling well. Um, so lots of bugs going around. We can be praying for one another. Um, but how else can we be praying for you guys? Um, I appreciate prayer for one of my friends at work. Her name is Brenda, and her father passed away unexpectedly in December, and she had not been able to see him for the last three years. Uh, so that was a bit of a, it was a hard, hard uh, time for her. Uh, and then I'm thankful for a good first week of classes, and also that I was able to visit with some of my family uh, over the break. Thank you. Oh, praise Good. my um, cousin. We've been praying for Rachel. Um, she was able to go up and get her husband and bring him back down from Michigan. So he's living with them now in Kentucky. She said he's moving about, but his he doesn't have speech right now, and he doesn't really have much a vision. So still a long way to go. But praise God, he's with them. He's more alert and. Um, just ease home, which is really a blessing. That's, is that Joseph? Joseph. Rachel's Joseph. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. Um, Richard and Abby Russell are having their baby tomorrow. Well, okay, so that's the Russells. Any others? Good. Okay, so I will open us, and if a couple people could jump in and pray, that would be awesome. And then uh, I will close this up. Let's go, Brendan. All right, here we come to you as those whose days are numbered, numbered by you. We often live and like that's not the case. Um, like we're in control of our lives, and I'm grateful that there's Sundays and brothers and sisters throughout the week to remind me and your word and truth to remind me uh, that you are eternal and sovereign over all things. That you are the one that numbers my days, uh, and it's for my good. Um, and so, God, I pray that we would come boldly and humbly. Confessing and knowing and praying to you as those who know that you are king over all things and rejoicing and grateful uh, at the many blessings that you pour into our lives. God, give us eyes to see uh, truth, to see you at work by your spirit in the small things and in the big things in our lives. And we can turn to you and rejoice and worship and to celebrate and be grateful to receive the many gifts that you have for us. And so God, now I pray that you would hear the prayers of your people. Father, thank you for the arrival of Arlo. Uh, thank you that um, Heather is feeling better than Najah has gone away. And thank you for that family and the way that they love their children and love
love you and are teaching them to know you at a young age. And I pray for my friend Brenda. Whenever someone dies, I always hope that that makes the family think about what happens when you die, where you go, what's next, and that that would be an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work in hearts to uh, draw them to you. So I pray that that would be the case with Brenda.
Lord, thanks for Richard and Maggie and the Russell family. God, we pray that you would bless uh, the birth of this little one tomorrow. God, we pray that it would go smoothly. And that even now, that little baby would somehow, in a way that I don't have to understand, would be leaping for joy at, at being a child of your kingdom. Um, God, would that baby arrive uh, and not know a moment um, out of your care, out of your love and affection. Thanks for bringing that family to us. And God, I pray that you would love and serve them well. Multiply sleep for them, Father, in these coming weeks. And two, I'm thankful for Sharon. Thanks for uh, her willingness to share and open up. And then uh, I thank you that you kept her safe and blessed her time traveling and visiting. Uh, and thanks for a good first week for her. God, I pray that she would be able to say the same thing in 15 years. It was a good 15 to me. So God, sustain her through this semester. She is a gift to those students at Radford. God, would you um, use her to bless students uh, this semester, not only in their studies, God, but um, personally. And, and, um, that, that she would have little moments to speak into their, into their lives, into their hearts. God, I'm grateful, too, for the chance to continue to pray for and lift up Rachel and Joseph. Lord, I imagine that the heightened sense of dependency for Joseph could be discouraging, lonely, hard. And so, Lord, I pray that you would sustain his spirit day by day. And his kids, too, and then I ask that you would uh, uh, give Rachel rest each night. Lord, help her not to grow weary. Give them a body that uh, is able to love them and serve them um, well. And God, we ask and pray, we long for healing for him, um, total healing, that he would be able to see again, be able to speak again. Um, Lord, we know that that day is coming regardless in this world or the next. So, God, strengthen him, give him hope. Uh, he and his family. And Lord, thanks for this Sunday, the chance to step back and to assess and consider our ways as a church, um, as a broader church within the country, um, about how we approach life. And, and I pray that you, well, God, I pray that our laws in this, in this land, in this world, in this country, would, would be more in line with Justice would be more in line with your um, teachings and your truth. Um, Lord, I don't know how you accomplish that, and it's not up to me. But God, I pray that it would nonetheless come true. We would be a country uh, with rules and laws and attitudes that fall more in line with the kingdom. Uh, and God, give us wisdom as we speak to those around us. Lord, this um, subject can be hard to talk about, um, but it is nonetheless true and um, so give us wisdom and courage. Lord, I pray that we would live lives in step with what it is we, we say we believe. Um, whether that comes to little babies and how we care for young moms, young families, moms with unexpected pregnancies, um, our attitudes towards caring for those, and our attitudes towards how we care for people who get older, who in the culture that may not contribute anything, uh, Lord, give us. Give us space to consider the ways we think about and care for and love those um, who have different abilities and are in different seasons of their lives than us. Um, but again, Lord, we, we pray that more and more the truth of your kingdom would come to bear um, here in Christiansburg and Virginia and in our country and our world. And thanks that our hope is that uh, you, Lord, in the person of Jesus, are bringing that kingdom. Uh, one day it will be fully and completely inaugurated by your son and Lord we long for that day and so God I pray that as we uh, continue to worship and, and give you some of our, um, our offerings our tithes and our money Lord that it would be used to that end to serve and bless your kingdom and give us ears to hear the, the, the word uh, of truth from the Bible this morning in Jesus name Amen. we'll take the tithes and offerings we have some lectures come forward in the sound <laughs>
you guys are already standing, so we are going to sing the doxology. turn with me to Psalm 22. We're taking a break from our series through the Gospel of Matthew this week for Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Um, usually these sneak up on me after Christmas, so it's been a number of years since I think I've taken a Sunday to especially preach around this topic. Um, I won't be saying everything about it. I'll be saying a few things that are true and that I hope will encourage us and Form us in the way we think about uh, life, human life, the dignity of all human life. But here at the beginning, I just want to remind us that we're all sinners. Right? We are all in great need of our Savior. We are utterly dependent upon God's grace to restore and forgive and repair what sin has harmed. Right? Even the congregation of our size or a gathering of this number of people, there's likely that there's someone that's in some way been affected uh, by abortion uh, or participated in, in some way. And so at the very beginning here, we're, we're going to talk about the, the evil of that and the sin of it, but it's not the unforgivable sin. Right? Uh, the blood of Christ covers uh, all sin. Um, and so I want you to know that the grace of God is for you. If you are particularly humbled or chastened or convicted about uh, your participation in these things in some way. Uh, Psalm 22, you'll recognize, I think, many of you will recognize the first verse, is, which was on the lips of Jesus at the cross. But I'm particularly interested in a few verses verses 9 through 11. So I'm going to read Psalm 22, verses 1 through 11. <coughs> Follow along with me. It's a psalm of David. He wrote, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to, to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you in my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Would you pray with me? On these words, when David was facing trouble, Father, he cried out to you. When there seemed to be none to help, he lifted his voice to you. And so, Father, we come now asking for your help. Because we cannot change ourselves, let alone the world around us. 
in our own strength, by our own words. Lord, we need you to revive us. We need you to make things new. We need you to bring forth justice in our land. We need you. And so we ask for the help of your spirit now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to begin with a few words written by a young man named Jared, who was a guest contributor uh, and wrote an article for the Desiring God website. It began like this. This is Jared writing. I was 21 years old when I sat in a high-risk pregnancy clinic with my wife after her level two ultrasound. Doctors told us Levi had all the markers for Down syndrome. After declining in, declining in amniocentesis, we were ushered straight away into the next room where a genetic counselor told us we had options. She explained we were too far along in our 22 weeks pregnant to terminate in Minnesota but they could connect us with someone in Chicago or Phoenix. My wife and I sat shell-shocked, first from the news about our son's diagnosis, and second from the attempts to exterminate him. Now, can you imagine how weighty that would have been for a 21-year-old father, halfway through a pregnancy? And yet, thankfully, Jared knew enough to know that that life in his wife's womb was a person, a life worthy of dignity and love. In fact, the title of the essay is A Fragile Life Worth All Our Love. It's really, as we look at a number of songs and verses from the Bible, that's where, that's the point I want to press home, that the unborn are people too. The unborn are people too. And so we begin here in Psalm 22, which I read earlier. Written by David during a time of great anguish. He's surrounded by enemies, feels alone, and he's crying out to God. The opening words were used by Jesus, the truly innocent sufferer as he hung alone on the cross. I've already mentioned I'm most interested in these verses in verses 9 through 11, where as David is crying out for help for the presence of the Lord, he does so on the basis of the fact that the Lord has been faithful to him his whole life long, and not just from birth. God has been faithful to David, personally involved in his life from the womb from the very beginning of his existence. And so he writes there in verse 10, On you, God, he's crying out to God, On you I was cast from birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Often on Saints of Human Life Sunday, we'll go to Psalm 139, where we read similar words, don't we, about God's intimate activity in our lives when we are in the womb. If you'd like to turn with me to Psalm 139, verse 13. Here again, David wrote, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, embryo man. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. Another psalmist, Psalm 71, this is not attributed to David. The psalmist wrote, For you, O Lord, are my hope. Psalm 71, verse 5. My trust, O Lord, for my youth. Upon you I have leaned from before my birth. Yet you are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually to 
These are words given to the church. <coughs> For us, is a testimony that, that God loves us, God is forming us, God is with us from before our birth. It's not just David. Would you turn with me to Isaiah 49? Let's hear Isaiah's testimony. The page is over to the right. Prophet Isaiah wrote in chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 9, 49, verse 1. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. Of course, Jenny read earlier from Luke chapter 1. It's a, such a fun little passage where we read about John the Baptist and Jesus sort of interacting while they're still yet in the womb, babies weeping, loved by God, made in the image of God, spiritually alive. What do we learn from all these verses? But that all people from their earliest days in the womb are made in God's image and God in them. They have a right to life and are worthy of love. So ethical theologian, ethicist and theologian, John Jefferson Davis, who writes about these things. He, he writes about what a person is. I, I really appreciate the way he writes. Let me quote, Davis writes, a person is a being to which God relates in a personal way. It is God's initiative in relationship that personalizes the creature. We are persons because God relates to us in a personal way, in a way that he doesn't with other creatures. You've heard from David, Isaiah. How about Job, Job chapter 10? He, he writes, you clothed me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews. You have granted me life and steadfast love. Your care has preserved my spirit. And Job understands God to be his God in a personal way, knitting together the very sinews of his body and also granting him steadfast love and care. Every person made in the image of God is there's a fundamental dignity, a right to life, because God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And so we read in Genesis 1, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Every person bears the image of God, even if it's twisted and spoiled by sin, it's still there, and so every person is worthy of love. As those who have received the love of God, but we did not deserve it, He cares for us. How can we not love every person made in His image? Paul wrote, Oh, nothing, oh, no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And of course, the unborn are persons made in the image of God, and they are our neighbors. And so we owe them love. Now, a culture of death requires some way around these truths of personhood, these calls to love. So I want us to think for a minute just about how this works. It, it often begins with euphemisms, the twisting of language, and then the genesis or the, the uh, execution of Jewish people in Germany so many years ago by the Nazis began with words. Jews were called rats. 
The Rwandan genocide began with words. People of the Tutsi tribe were called cockroaches. At one time, Native Americans were called savages. Those of African descent were called property. So we see through history, this happens time and time again. And now the abortion industry has improperly weaponized medical terminology to create a distance from reality. Instead of killing a child, it's eliminating a fetus. That's a, a euphemism. Words used in the service of evil and sin. Abortion is not health care. You don't care for someone's health by killing them. Abortion is the intentional killing of a child. And so we have to be careful about the way language is used and how we might drift into the use of that language. Abortion is the killing of a human person before birth. Now, much of modern law concerning abortion has been manufactured around the idea of viability in the attempt to give the appearance of some rationality to this uh, outrage. The argument being that a fetus isn't a person until it has viability outside the womb. But that's just an arbitrary, it's, it's just made up, right? The, this measure of viability has changed over time. At the time Roe v. Wade was decided around the concept of viability, viability was around 28 weeks. Well, every 10 years, it's backed up a week. So now we're around 22, approaching 21 weeks. So for years, children were killed, 22, 23, 24 weeks, when possibly they, they, they could have survived. The notion of viability is an arbitrary concern construction because we're all dependent creatures. Your vulnerability doesn't have anything to do with your personhood. The level of dependence that you have at any moment does not determine your personhood. A, a baby in the womb's dependence upon their mother does not determine their personhood. For thinking biblically, we must say that God is the only totally viable, self-sustaining being, right? Paul declared, we can find in Acts chapter 17, verse 28, in him we live and move and have our being. A diabetic isn't less of a person because they're utterly dependent upon insulin, right? We will not be less of a person when we grow old and we need someone to feed us and bathe us. Unborn children are not less because they're dependent upon their mothers. Children are not potential persons, only counted as people when they reach certain milestones. They're actual persons from conception, even as they have great potential in front of them. So that, those are the, the main points I wanted us to hear and deal with from God's word this morning. Even the unborn are persons. Their dependence, their vulnerability does not take away from their personhood, their dignity, their right to life, their right to love. Now I just want us to be aware of a few new challenges. I'm not well read on these things, but I've been trying to follow things more closely recently, especially given the fact that Roe v. Wade may be overturned this year by the U.S. Supreme Court as it decides a challenge against a Mississippi law that's banning abortions earlier than 15 years. This could be a long-awaited victory at that level of the courts that will put abortion law back to the states. So we need to be praying for that Supreme Court decision, but also for our state legislators, for our local PRCs, uh, that there would be good and just laws in the Commonwealth of Virginia. I want you also to be aware of the changing ground of really where we're dealing with uh, and trying to meet women these days. Especially during the pandemic, 
the number of medical abortions, that is those that are by prescription, <coughs> like medicine, as opposed to surgical abortions, has increased dramatically because during COVID they had to move away from in-person to telehealth. So you can prescribe, write these prescriptions uh, virtually. And so the numbers of those types of abortions has gone up from before the pandemic, even from 2010 to 2019, the number of medical abortions by prescription rose 123%. 2019, that was around 42% of the total. It's certainly much higher now in 2021 and 2022. So the point is, our local PRC, personal relationships, relationships with vulnerable women are going to be more important than ever. Because they, we won't be able to intercept women at a clinic or later on in their pregnancy because it's going to become much, much easier if existing laws stay the same way to, to get a medical abortion very early in pregnancy by telehealth appointments, sometimes even across state lines. So what do we do that, with this? Well, I want you to consider, are there places in your life where you can befriend young women and be a safe, listening ear so that you might be called upon in times of trouble? To give you an example, this happened to us just a few years ago. Danielle was called upon by a young woman. She couldn't be more than 19 who we had gotten to know at a local swimming pool. And somehow she got the idea that Danielle might be a person who would listen to her and who she could trust. So I'm just putting up, think about that. Are there places in your lives where you can befriend young women who might be vulnerable and be a safe, listening ear? So that's one thing I want you to be thinking about and be aware of. Another thing I really want to put before you this morning is the current reality of prenatal testing. We have a lot of young families in our church, a lot of young women, and we need to be aware and thinking and wise about prenatal testing. This is something even the, the mainstream media and even liberal news outlets are recognizing uh, what's going on here that's driven by money. New York Times printed an expose on January 1st of this year. You can go look, I encourage you to go look at this. The New York Times, not exactly a conservative outlet, right? It's an expose on prenatal testing and the overblown promises offered by these companies who do blood and DNA testing. If you're in medical field, you really need to be aware of this, right? In some cases, 85% of positive results are false positives. Okay? They're just, they're, it's a very lucrative business. There's a lot of money behind these things, and they're serving money, not mercy. There is a place for some prenatal testing so that you can be prepared if you're facing a, a child with Down syndrome or some other condition. But often, to be prepared is not the end goal of those who are administering of these tests or doing genetic counseling. So all I am encouraging you to do today is to be aware, to ask good questions, to be informed. If you're being told that you need to pursue uh, prenatal testing in any form, just do your homework. Talk to wise people, ask questions. Consider where is this headed? Because I know from experience during our pregnancies and miscarriages that we were sort of shuffled along and, and put into these situations that we didn't realize we were having this ultrasound in Roto because the end goal is the possibility in their minds of abortion, which had never even entered our minds. A child with a dis disability or abnormality is a person made in the image of God, deserving the love and care of parents and the church. Right. 
So we want to be that kind of place where if, if there was a child born in our church that needed a ton of care, and those parents needed a ton of help, that they would know that we would be there for them. We want to get to the place where we're thinking beyond just that abortion would be illegal, but that it would be unthinkable right? because of a change in our culture. Friends, we are in a spiritual battle for love. <laughs> this is a spiritual battle where we need to be thinking through our own hearts, what do we value most? The Bible wants to challenge our devotions. What are we devoted to? Because of comfort, control, efficiency, financial stability, or our highest loves, then something even as heinous as abortion becomes plausible. But the gospel works in us higher goals, higher loves, higher values. God wants to change the things we are devoted to so that we might be discerning in the things we're giving ourselves to and be devoted to the good and the true and the beautiful. These are things that we can live every day. The, the Bible doesn't give us catchphrases, right, to use when we're talking about these things. The Bible doesn't give us, like, political points to make. The Bible wants to reshape us so that every day we're a people who are cultivating a love for life, cultivating a, a, a love for things that are good, cultivating a respect for all of God's creation, all made in his image. The Spirit renews our minds. And part of that is to understand that the most vulnerable are to be treated as the most valuable. Right? This is how the church is different from the world. The most vulnerable are to be treated as the most valuable. God knows us and he cares for us inside and out. And he wants us to be his instruments of caring for everyone inside and out. God delights to draw near to the weak and needy. We see that again and again in the Gospels. Jesus drawing near to those who are hurting or ashamed. We want to become a people who are drawing near naturally to the weak and the needy. God delights to provide to, for the desperate when they cry out to him. We want to be a people who are delighting to draw, to draw alongside and, and help the desperate and to be a comfort. In God's kingdom, sins are forgiven. Sinners ransomed and redeemed. Things are being made new. We want to be a part of that. God supplies all our needs. And so comes this wonderful freedom and trusting that doing the right thing will never ruin your life. Right? And that's the sort of thing we want to get into our hearts and minds before we're in a crisis. I stole that one from John Piper. He, he goes on to write, I mean, he writes, doing the will of God by trusting the grace of God will never ruin your life, never. So many abortions happen because of economic concerns, concerns over loss of opportunity. We want to be a people saying, doing the right thing, loving this child will never ruin your life. With God's help, never. See, God doesn't promise us ease. He doesn't promise that there will never be trouble or suffering or heartache, but that any trials and grief we, we face, He's there with us. And somehow He's working out His greater purposes of love. So I want to close now with another paragraph that Jared Mulverhill wrote in that Desiring God article. He went on to write, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This is a long road with many tears. Four open heart surgeries, extended stays in the hospital, trach and ventilator, feeding tubes, medical bills, in-home nursing care, 
doctor visit after doctor visit, therapy after therapy. It pains my heart to watch Levi struggle to do so many things that come easily for most children. Living, living with a disability has and continues to be emotionally, financially, and relationally costly, and God gives more grace. Here's where the gospel comes in. We are living the truth of Psalm 126. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. And we have experienced, this is his testimony, we have experienced over and over again the abundance of his steadfast love and nearness. A common phrase in our home has become, let's bask in the faithfulness of God. There is an intimacy with Christ known only through suffering. We have truly tasted and seen that the Lord is good. What is a lifetime of sacrifice now when we have an eternal weight of glory coming? These are the truths we need to take in deep down into our hearts that will make us a different sort of people. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. We bask in the faithfulness of God. His is a steadfast love and nearness. He will never forsake his people. We have truly tasted that the Lord is good. And whatever sacrifices we make now, whatever afflictions we walk through, cannot compare to the eternal weight of glory that is ours in Christ. Would you pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for these promises that those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Oh, Lord, would you make us a people who love the things you love. Make us a people who love life and want to share the love and the hope you've <coughs> graced us with, with others, Lord. Make us useful in your kingdom. Help us to be a part of the great rescue you are working out in this fallen and broken world. Bring us alongside people who need the hope we have. Lord, and we do pray for good and just laws in our state and our country. We pray for these upcoming Supreme Court decisions. We pray for just really truth and goodness to prevail. For your will be your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come, Lord Jesus. Draw near to those who are hurting, to those who are frightened, to those who are afraid, to those who need your grace. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and respond to singing. Man of sorrows, man of God. It's in him that we find our salvation. Let's stand and sing.
20 minutes to fellowship and then get out of here. Please grab baby bottles out there in the foyer to support the BRC. And there are a couple different books out there I, I just got for free, so I'm going to pass them all to anybody that would like them. They're on the uh, table in the foyer as well. But now, go in the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the peace of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.